Go ahead, Steve, take it away. Thank you for joining us for this evening's weekly Chew on This podcast recording, streaming to you live from the studios of WAJC FM 91.7 on your FM radio dial. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out your faith in Christ, living it out loud within our messy and busy ahead, lives. Steve. The content of this discussion comes from the pastoral preaching notes and this live small group discussion these notes will prompt here tonight, something we call a community-based learning experience. Come now, chew on this with us. Have you ever said, no, wait a minute, no, maybe, have you ever heard it said? It was amazing. Hmm. What is genuine ministry? This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine with with Sam Beeman along with Bruce Nelson and our very own Otto Lundy and Pastor Robin Bjornsson joining us remotely. We thank you for joining us for this week's discussion on Chew on This. Our topic this week is considering 2 Corinthians. Genuine Christian ministry is being discussed here live Wednesday night, April 15th. All sermon and discussion notes, which are very raw and on a handout, are available at realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. It is important that everyone understands that what we're talking about tonight is genuine Christian ministry based on the experience and the writings of Paul the Apostle. He is having this conversation, this years-long conversation with this church in Corinth that he planted, and he is helping them learn from the beginning. This is all brand new stuff. What is genuine Jesus-like ministry? So now Paul plants this church here in Corinth. He stays there for about a year and a half. He goes to Ephesus to do the same. While he's in Ephesus, he gets a letter from Chloe saying, help, help, help. So he writes 1 Corinthians. He sends it back there with Timothy. Ah, the Corinthian church goes a bit crazy. So Paul hurries over there from Ephesus and they treat him with such disrespect. There's opponents waiting for him. They insult him. They rebuke him. He is so disheartened. He goes back to Ephesus, and he writes this thing called the severe letter, which is now lost. But he sends that letter, which is referred to in 2 Corinthians 2, but he sends it back to the church with Titus. Now he is sitting on these hot coals wondering what this church he loves with all his heart, what they are thinking of this reprimand. And he is waiting, and he ends up going to Macedonia from Ephesus, and he meets Titus there, and he hears from Titus that there was a majority of the church had repented and understood what genuine Christian ministry was supposed to be like. And in response to that experience, Paul pens 2 Corinthians. And then eventually, it says in Acts 20, Paul makes his final visit to Corinthians, and they believe he writes the letter to Rome and to the Roman church from that city. So here, this is this background. He is working with this group of people, wanting them to know what it is like to live in healthy Christian community. And he is bound and determined They are going to understand this. With every corpuscle that he has, he's using everything that he has at his hands to make sure this church is not led astray in any fashion. So those of you who are listening to us tonight, and those of you who will be listening to us as a podcast, right now is a really good time to make sure you have a Bible close by. And it wouldn't hurt to have a notebook either. But if you have a Bible close by, you'd be able to look at these verses And yes, thanks to technology and our own Bruce Nelson, these verses that we're talking about tonight will be popping up on the live stream, which is on our Facebook page, Maranatha Forest Lake. I would like to ask our listeners that are are with us live tonight, here is the question of the night. This is the one question, and you can have an opportunity then to think about it and respond back, and Sam will read your responses and we'll talk back and forth with you, because hey... 
we're live. We might as well enjoy it, right, Sam? If we have some questions and comments, send Absolutely. it on there, right Absolutely. on our Facebook page. So here, are you ready? Here is the big question to all our listeners, or all, all our viewers. I forget, viewers camera, high camera, yeah. viewers and listeners. It's mainly viewers, because listeners will be, anyway, hey, if you're here with us tonight, here's your question. What, what kind of actions in your world speak to you of God's heart, of God's love? What kind of actions actually speak to you of God's heart, of a, of a servant heart? Um, are there things that you have done that express that, or maybe things done towards you that express God's heart? So we're looking for actions that say, this is God's heart. And this is why that question is being shared. I was talking about this message with my husband, Pastor Mike, senior pastor here at Maranatha, and my boss, which is so much fun. And I mean that sincerely. <laughs> and no, because, no yeah, sarcasm no, at all, no, I no, I can punch him. Hey, how many of you can actually punch your boss in the air and say, hey, knock it off? Or, hey, go get me lunch. You know, you it's wonderful. <laughs> But we're having this conversation, and he, he said, you absolutely positively have to make this statement. All genuine ministry begins here. You have to let him know that. There's two places that show us where genuine I mean, he was having his very own Paul moment in our kitchen when we were having this conversation. And he said, make sure you bring up Matthew 10, Matthew 10, 42, and then Mark 9, 34, and 37. These are slides that will be coming up on the screen. Matthew 10, 42, pretty familiar for quite a few people. Matthew 10, 42 says this, And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. And then in Mark 9, 34 through 37, but focusing on just verse 35, it says, And he sat down and he called the twelve and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. This idea of Jesus is teaching the concept of servant leadership, of, of servant ministry, that if we are not motivated with the servant's heart, you cannot have genuine Christian mm -hmm. ministry. That is where it comes from. You can never separate ministry from motivation. Actions are always, there's always some motivation behind it, and you cannot separate them. That is why we encourage one another to read our Bibles and to study and to delve into it and practice application. This is why the Wednesday night crew exists, because we want to take scripture and figure out what it looks like in behavior, because that is how we can make sure our motivation and our behavior match. So the question Basically, Jesus is asking us what these verses is, well, <laughs> who are you serving? And actually, Paul begins asking this question. Because he's finding in the church of Corinth, while he wasn't there, not all of the ministry being done, unfortunately, came from a servanthood mentality. Things began to grow, and they morphed, and they became very, very personalized in the city of Corinth. And of course, that was the only church this has ever happened to, where personalities overtook ministry. I'm sure it's never happened since then. Or, or a, certain, a certain gift became the moniker of the ministry, like the gift of healing, which comes not through a person, but via the Holy Spirit. We are just asked to pray and ask for it. So I'll ask the team here. I'll ask you, Pastor Robin and Steve and Sam, what, what kind of things have you heard and seen in today's society that has been purported, that has been said, oh, this is genuine Christian ministry? Hmm. You know, I think uh, with all the events and things going on around the church, there's, there's so many um, people that are willing to volunteer their time and their effort and to to show yes. God's love to the people that attend these events. Yes. Um, thinking about blessing the bikes and the car show, and then obviously game dinner that I'm heavily involved in. Um, I mean, yes. and a lot of the time you see the same people. Yes. It's the same faces you see at each and every one of those events that are put in there. Their effort and willing to spend time and administer to those people that attend. And I, I think the key word that you said in there, Sam, is this concept of, I'm excited to serve. Yep. I'm excited to serve. So you can see that there is this motivation. Pastor Robin, do you have a thought on that? 
either um, in the supportive or the oh my goodness this didn't work real well side <laughs> right the, uh, well you know it's interesting because um, here lately I've just been exposed to a number of Christian concerts you know there's uh, um, incredible worship music going on and and all that other kind of stuff so you know talking about people hearing the word and ingesting the word and you know, your whole body's involved in that, depending upon what their percussion is doing. And and uh, so it's been interesting to just watch the impact even of so many people coming, you know, hungry, looking for, um, I don't know, the, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. comfort of the heart through worship music. Yes. Mm-hmm. How about you, Otto? Well, it's I've talked to some people and they get really jazzed up. You mean like this? Jazz. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, you said jazz. I had to respond. <laughs> they go to these humongous churches and they, oh, they must be really right on because it's they've got, you know, 3,000 people there. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. They're all excited. They're all excited about it, you know. It's, well, it's easy to motivate a large group of people. So yes, yep, they can easily, yep. Yeah. I didn't think about that one, but that's true. I know back in the day, um, Otto and Robin, both of you, Pastor Robin, you would remember this, that healing services really hit. People who felt that they had a quote-unquote healing ministry, having a misunderstanding, of course, in my opinion, of what the gifts of the Spirit are for, thinking they just got that one, that I'm a healer. And it's like, you can't be a healer because the Holy Spirit's the healer. You are the person that asks for the healing. And uh, we would have a long conversation if they'd ever asked me that, but they never did. But <laughs> there were these services dedicated towards that. And it's like, they felt that they were, that's what God had gifted them with. And it's like, unfortunately, that, that gets in that slippery little middle piece of what is the motivation? Is the motivation, you know, obviously we, we want people who are suffering to be healed. I mean, we're living in that echo, in that right in our face right now with mm-hmm. the COVID epidemic. But unfortunately, sometimes you end up in a service where it doesn't feel like healing is the focus, but it said it was a healing service, and it just feels weird. You end up walking away feeling weird. And I have been in a few different services where the process of praying for people for healing was, in my opinion, disrespectful, but it was very person-centered, in the, it was centered on the person who was praying for the healing. And, you know, I was young at the time I didn't have any gray hair and I didn't even have any children, so it was quite a while ago. And you walk away and I, you know, I don't know what to say except that was not for me. I didn't enjoy that. But now as, you know, a much older Christian, I would go back to say that that was not genuine Christian ministry because they did not handle the Word of God with respect. They didn't treat the people with respect. Their focus was on them being a healer instead of on the people receiving God's message. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are going to ask for them to be healed. And there was just kind of this mess. And sometimes, unfortunately, I see that same mindset where I have to go to a church that has this amazing worship music, and if they don't have a band, and if they don't have this, and if I don't feel during the worship part, it's not the church for me. And what's really, really, I wonder if Paul was sitting here, and I kind of see that he was, because we had the opportunity, uh, some of the pastors here from Maranatha, the Assemblies of God here in Minnesota years ago, had Dr. Jack Hayford come and do a training at a prayer conference for the pastors and leaders of churches. And in there, this guy has written thousands and thousands of worship songs. He's one of the most creative and prolific Pentecostal pastors that have touched the planet and just... He is one of my mentors. I just enjoy everything I can get my hands on that he has written. But he talked about at that conference, standing up on the stage saying that he felt we were going to be going into a time where what true worship was, was going to be lost because people wanted music more than they wanted worship. And that the actual worship process process could be lost and he was encouraging the pastors to not lose the motivation behind this do not replace genuine worship with a really really good concert Mm -hmm. and it was interesting because since then we've seen it come to pass i've seen it said more and more and that's where i think paul if he was here today paul would agree with dr hayford and he would say be wary be very wary of emotion-led or feeling-led ministry 
If the, the, what, the ministry that's going on is this feeling that you, you are feeling all this stuff and, and they want you to have these feelings, ministry isn't a feeling. Feelings come later, just like in life. Your emotions are the caboose of your life. They are not what drives your life. Because if your feelings drive your life, you're going to be in a wreck because feelings are not dependable. They move and change and they get touched and hurt. And sometimes, believe it or not, are you ready? Feelings lie to you. <gasps> what? Yes. So we need, as our litmus test, as our measurement, the genuine Christian ministry comes from a motivation of servanthood. It doesn't come from a motivation of what makes me feel. But I'd rather feel because servanthood is not as much fun. There's no glitter. Sam, there's it's no hard. glitter. It's hard. There's no poof. Doesn't come naturally. You know, so, <laughs> is Jesus more glorified by me enjoying this Christian concert or by me actually cleaning the bathroom at the place yeah. so the people... Anyway, that's yeah. a long conversation. <laughs> so, this is just the beginning. Let's get going and looking at some of these verses and actually see what Paul said. Because guess what? Paul is even more opinionated than me when it comes to things like this. They say, in one of the commentaries on um, the Bible Speaks Today, they say that establishing true criteria for genuine Christian ministry is one of the major contributions of this letter, 2 Corinthians. It talks about what is genuine. Because remember, the people that opposed Paul said he wasn't a true apostle and his ministry wasn't genuine. And they believe that because the Church of Corinth actually grew and stayed and became a staple of that area that the very existence of the church attested to the fact that Paul knew what in the world he was talking about because the church survived. He understood how to lead. And so because he withstood and went through these unbelievable, voracious personal attacks, he decided when he wrote Second Corinthians to say some things about them, to help train those that he already knew that they were receiving these things, so he was going to write them and encourage them. So our very first one, we're going with 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 12. There are quite a few, so as we go through them, I may just refer to the verse and not read it, but we'll start here and read this one. 2 Corinthians 5, and 11 and 12 says this, Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we, we, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, no, no. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. Yes, boys and girls, Paul wrote that. <laughs> so, um, team at the table, team by remote, what do you think Paul is saying is genuine Christian ministry in those, those verses there? What would you pick out of there? It says, oh, genuine Christian ministry has this as a hallmark. First one that jumps out as me is work hard. <laughs> I know. There and kind of hang yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> work hard. Yes. You're, you might sweat. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard work. I mean, it's going to require time. It's going to require mm -hmm. sacrifice. Yep. Anything else? Well, I think about that uh, um, when he brings up this concept of sincerity, you know, there uh, as we're working hard, well, yeah, we're working hard sincerely, but we're also really sincere yes. as we're working hard. Yes, yes. It that talks to me about the servant heart. Yes, I would think that is kind of a transferable concept mm -hmm. there. Yes, mm -hmm. yep. Sam, you have anything you want to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, just not, not telling the world about how great you are and look what I'm doing. <laughs> Right. Oh, yes. Yes. Ooh, this is my. Yeah, yeah. This is me. Look what I yeah. can do. We have a right. friend, my husband and I. Whenever anyone names a ministry after themselves, he goes, "They just go down in my estimation." <laughs> he goes, "Call it something about Jesus. Don't put your name on it." As yeah. I go, well, you know, personal right. opinion. But I thought that was kind that's, of funny. That's right. There, verse <laughs> yes. twelve. Yes. Right. All right. Let's jump into Second Corinthians three, two, and three. We do have. A nice stack of these, and we have all kinds of things to talk about after we get through this. So I hope I'm not going too quickly for our listening audience. And Sam, if you have anyone who's come up with an action that speaks of God's heart, that they know this action says this is God's heart or a servant heart, if you have any of those, just let me know no, when they come up. Sure will. Sure okay, will. Second Corinthians 3, 2 and 3. The only letter of recommendation we need is you ourselves, your lives. Our letter written in our hearts, 
everyone can read it and recognize, recognize our good work among you. Look at you, you grown-up Christian, you. Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It's carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. Oh, the anointing, yes, in Jesus' name. So what do you think Paul is saying in that portion of Scripture about genuine Christian ministry? I think it's it's talking about showing it through actions. It yes. doesn't not have to be written down and followed a Yes. A, a yeah. The checklist. Book, right. Here we done go. That, done that, there you done go. This. Okay. Oh, then Santa can come and bring yeah. you a present. It's yep. the little checklist. Checking it twice. Yeah. Pastor it's, Robin. Well, you know, for me, there's a progression in this because. Oh yeah. Oh you yeah. Know, when he talks about recognizing the good work among you, um, Paul had evidently deposited this. He had invested his life and all of these biblical teachings in people, and now he can sit back and look at what has happened in their life and how they're pouring out as a result of embracing these yes. biblical concepts. Yes. So he's watching evidence of a changed life yes. because yes. of all of this. <laughs> yes. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Did you have anything you wanted to add, Otto? Well, just to follow up on what Pastor Robin said there, that there would be, you would physically see a change in people, in their temperament yeah. and their emotions. You're going to... Yeah. You, you, you better see something or something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, you've seen evidence of it. It was all around them. Oh, that had to be exciting. He had a love penning that portion of this letter. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on. What are Paul's guidelines for genuine Christian ministry? Let's look in 2 Corinthians 3 again, but let's look at verses 10 through 17. And we're not going to read all of them because it's a lot. But we're going to start looking at verse 12. In here, okay, now what is he saying? Believe it or not, there is a ton of stuff in this portion. I mean, I had all kinds of fun. Oh, he's saying this. Could he mean this? Oh, what about that? Oh, look at this. So have fun as we're reading this, starting with verse 12. 2 Corinthians 3, starting with verse 12. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be bold. We're not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see his glory, even though it was destined to fade away. He's talking about in Exodus 34, 34, when Moses would spend time with God, he would glow like a neon stick and the people were like, no, we can't be, it was so freaking them out that he actually had to put a veil on his face and let it fade away until the next time he went in and then he'd have to put it back on and it's like, okay, I can understand that. I mean, I have not seen a human being glow like a glow stick, but <laughs> something was going on that freaked him out. And All right, so he's, he's talking about, okay, that kind of glory and it faded away. Verse 14, but the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, that same veil covers their minds, so they can't understand the truth. And this veil, this thing that covers and helps us not see the truth to believe in lies, this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil, and they don't understand But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Oh, preach it, Paul. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yes. And they're dancing in the Church of Corinth when this was being read. All right. One of the big ones that speaks to me out of this is witnessing. This idea of boldness, of confidence. That is a sign of genuine Christian mm-hmm. ministry. This idea of not witnessing about your talents, like you're talking about earlier, Sam, mm-hmm. but witnessing about Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus can do for you. Do you realize what his death, burial, and resurrection? I say that phrase together all the time because it is the thing. It is the, the key that ripped that veil in two and opened up things in the eternal part of the supernatural world to be accessible to us now so we don't have to wait for everything until we get into eternity. So this idea of being able to witness, that is a part of being a bold, confident witness of Jesus Christ, to me, is a genuine sign of Christian ministry. Pastor Robin, Otto, Sam, do you have any other thoughts on this one? No, not really. I mean, one of the things I think about, though, is uh, how kind. You know, the simplicity in verse 16, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Yes. I mean, 
It's like Jesus is looking for that tiniest bit of attention and direction his way. And he's happy to jump in there and help you and redeem you and rescue you. And it's, yeah, yes. it's just that simple. The Turn word is the understanding. Lord. That is mm-hmm. a sign of genuine Christian ministry. It helps you understand scripture. It helps you understand all of this. Mm-hmm. Amen. Otto, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, it's, uh, as I remember when I first became a Christian, 10, what year is this? 2020? <laughs> just say a while ago. It was just a while ago, Otto. <laughs> in the mid 80s, you know, that stuff. And I hadn't read the Bible yet, the whole Bible. Mm-hmm. And to my friends and stuff like that, who I really don't see anymore, but I was trying to witness to them. And it was, you better turn or burn. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't carry over. <laughs> that didn't work at all. Were, I, was, I was sincere, but it was not in a loving, correct, gentle manner. Oh, goodness. Yes. Forgive yes. me, Lord. I, I worked it out with the Lord here many years ago. That's yeah, right. that was, Nothing quite as energetic as the newly saved. Yes. <laughs> so this combination of apologetics and lifestyle ministry that Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians 3, 10 through 17, that is a sign of true, genuine Christian ministry, where you understand the milieu, the people you're talking to, and you make an argument for Jesus that is appropriate to their understanding. And I also like how in here is written that that there's freedom. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. For those of you that listened to the Easter message this uh, past Sunday, as my husband Mick was preaching, he talked about um, because of the resurrection, the power of death died. Because of the resurrection, the mystery of death died. Because of the resurrection, the fear of death died. Because of the resurrection, the horror of death died. And he went down all these things that died on the cross with Jesus because of his death, burial, and resurrection. That freedom, that's a sign of genuine Christian ministry. That freedom of, I am done with that. I'm working my way towards this. I have confidence because I'm no longer bound up in this fear. So we find genuine Christian ministry unzips or sometimes slices away or sometimes crashes through and it gets through that fear that binds us up. Can yes, you tell? Darlene, yes. Here's an irony. Um, is It's a fascinating irony sometimes that freedom within the body of Christ can be so frightening to the body of Christ because you're just a little too free. <laughs> a little too free. <laughs> a little too free. A little too free. And it, depending on also, the culture within that you are living in, some right. prefer a little bit more staid behavior, and some are yeah. just really relaxed. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, ma'am. All righty, let's go on to 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 15. We have one little question, oh, or not doing? question, a comment here from Diane Rose, um, talking about witnesses. And she has lots of great stories of how God has worked because we dared to speak of him. We yes. dared to, we, yes. we stepped out. That confidence. Right. And took, she yeah, does get, took that step yeah, of faith. she does in places where people are, what we're talking about here, where they, they, they are in need of freedom. She gets the opportunity to speak there a lot. And that is amazing where yep. she, the confidence and boldness to say, Jesus mm-hmm. and amen, Diane, amen. Second Corinthians 4, 10 through 15 In here, Paul, once again, is talking about concepts of what is genuine Christian ministry. Remember, he was being told that he's faking it, that he he sounds forceful in the letter, but when they see him in person, he's just like, oh, it don't matter, and Mm -hmm. that he is... uh, he. He doesn't have any foundation, that he really isn't an apostle, he's not very well studied. It is interesting to think that Paul was probably considered very, very much a blue-collar worker back in the time, and you realize the dude wrote most of the New Testament, Um, (laughs) this idea. So those who were of a learned position had a harder time maybe wrapping their head around his ability to speak everyday words instead of the rhetoric of the very well-trained that were more of the Greek background and of the Greek schooling. And so he had all of this kind of stuff being thrown at his face when people didn't want to listen to him. So here he, he starts with verse 10 in 2 Corinthians 4. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. <laughs> that's everyone, every minister of Christ. That's our favorite sentence, right? <laughs> Everyone who loves Jesus. Yes, through suffering. <laughs> yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death 
but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke, just like Diane Rose said. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there'll be a, a great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. Amen. So what is he talking about in there? What kind of things are hallmarks or signs of genuine Christian ministry in those few verses? Doing it in spite of the hard, you know, yes. the difficulties yes. that we face and um, suffering can come in so many, you know, ways. Yes. And yet, really, regardless of the suffering, yes. Jesus is worth all of that effort and energy and People being free in him is worth all that effort and energy. And, you know, we're going to get to heaven, you know, at the end of this. And I don't think we're going to regret one moment of how hard we work to try to help people understand how much God loves them and wants a relationship with them. Okay, now, excuse me, Pastor Robin. You mean to say that when I fall in love with Jesus and commit myself to this lifestyle, to, to living according to Scripture, it's not going to be this beautiful walking in the Garden of Eden experience? Are you trying to tell me it's going to be, like, hard, and I'm going to not get what I want, and it's going to be so un-American? <laughs> you know, it, it, isn't it fascinating that it's almost like, unfortunately, Sometimes we can make the mistake when we witness that we don't share. I mean, we're never going to learn the whole truth. We can't know all of Scripture at once beforehand. You know, I think our heads would explode. But, you know, the idea of being rescued from our sins, sometimes either we can misunderstand that to mean we're being rescued from all of this problem that we're in and we're going to flip over the other edge and it's all going to be, you know, roses and <laughs> you know, the garden experience like you're talking about. And, you know, you've said this, you know, a number of times. This is not heaven. <laughs> yeah, I know. Shock, shock, it, putting in. Yeah, yeah, it's great that we're saved. It's great that we're born again. We have eternity with him waiting for us. We also have a relationship with him and the Holy Spirit now. Um, but it doesn't mystically, magically change this into heaven. That yes. is yet to come. So. Yes, yes, yes. It does not say that it's going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. Right? Yes. Yeah. To persevere yes. is what this is speaking if, to me. If any of our that. listening audience is, is a hiker, or earlier, Sam, we were talking about the Boundary Waters. Hey, we're in <laughs> Minnesota. I mean, we laugh because I will stay in a cabin on the edge where you go in it. You, I mean, this idea... Christianity is going into the boundary waters. It's, for, it's, it's work, for you, and you might get that, lost. It's the equivalent to facing death. <laughs> it's facing going death. to the boundary hey, waters. It was. <laughs> hey, trying to paddle that canoe across that lake was enough for me. <laughs> and it was really windy. We had an earlier story. Okay, yeah. so uh, this idea of it is worth it. I mean, if you've ever done something where you've had to really do hard things to achieve the end, anyone who's had a baby is like, uh, uh, all right, but I got the baby. That's why I won't get a tattoo. I've watched all my family has tats. I do not have a tattoo because I've seen it and it's painful and it bleeds and they have to wipe the blood away. And all you get is a picture. You don't even get a baby. Why would you go through something so painful <laughs> when you don't even get something as amazing as a baby? So that, that was my reasoning for not getting tatted. All right. So suffering. Back to this. I digress. Otto, did you have anything you wanted to add to this, what he's talking about, the, the suffering? and Yeah. it's um, In this day and age, in this wonderful freedom of speech country we don't have as much danger our danger right now would be danger of ridicule danger of being embarrassed or danger of you know trying to shame me well there's nothing anybody can do or say that would cause that the only danger i can see is that the danger that i'm going to be feel sorry for you for this person that's trying to come yes. after us come after a christian it's like that's, that's the worst you could do to me, is make me feel sorry for you. Yes. Yeah, we, we can't, it's hard for us in America to understand what he's talking about, this suffering piece here. Mm -hmm. But faith that denies oneself, I mean, this is part of true Christian ministry. There's denial. You deny what you want. 
because of what God is asking. Our obedience will say no to, to our own desires and yes to God's desires. And the goal here is for God to receive the glory. The goal is not for us to have our name printed. Not that it's bad. It's totally a personal decision. But it's not that our name gets printed on there. It's like Orlean Ministries. It's like, no. It is Jesus receiving the glory. That is where the, the, the focus of ministry is supposed to go for him and his name to be lifted up. Alrighty, let's keep moving ourselves along. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 10, and we're not going to read this. I'm just going to read a few of the verses in there because there's a lot of words. <laughs> and it's talking about, um, Paul is talking about, starting here with verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 6. It says, We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. And no one's going to find fault with our ministry because we're living in such a way to not cause people to stumble. And everything we do, we show we're true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. Then he goes down to verse 6. We prove ourselves by our purity. We prove ourselves by our understanding. We prove ourselves by our patience. We prove ourselves by our kindness. We prove ourselves by the Holy Spirit within us. And we prove ourselves by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. And then in verse 8, he says, we serve God whether people honor or despise us, like what you were talking about, Steve. Mm -hmm. So as you look at that portion of Scripture, what jumps out to you as far as genuine Christian ministry? I mean, he lists it pretty, pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. This idea of choosing to do things or not do things because it would cause someone to stumble. What if you live in a culture where wearing red is considered, <gasps> would you wear red? What if you live in a culture where the people who do not love Jesus believe if you cut your hair as a woman, you're a little bit of a loose individual? I mean, I'm using old-fashioned and whatever, but you can apply this to anything. Um, in my lifetime, I was introduced to a community that if a woman wore leather, mm-mm, mm-mm, no leather coat, no leather hat. Oh, don't even think of a leather skirt, leather pants. You were on the wrong side of Jesus if you wore that. <laughs> so would that make a difference? This idea of I'm not going to do this because it would. So have you ever experienced a place where you have been where you have chosen not to do something because it would cause someone to have a hard time with their faith? Yes. When I've been to other churches, and going, you know, when they're worshiping and stuff like that, a little more, I'm not sure what the term is, uh, laid back, church is conservative. Yes. And, you know, you want to joy, joy, joy to the Lord. And you just uh, better not get too wild here. They're going <laughs> to. So you didn't run around, around through the pews there, Otto? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really current example. Anyone else have a thought about that? Well, I think about the you know, the simplicity of the things that Paul is talking about right here. Um, we prove ourselves by our purity, understanding, patience, kindness, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. sincere love. We preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We serve God. I mean, he's just one thing after another. He's talking about normal life in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the you fruit know, of the spirit. He's talking about it, mature fruit. Yeah, exactly. It's not, um, you know, lights and smoke and, and ooh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just one yeah. foot in front of the other doing hey, the right things. But Pastor Robin, what if I like lights and smoke and glitter and ooh? What well, if I enjoy you that? Know what? I got to say, some of that stuff is fun, for yeah. sure. Yeah. But when we put that stuff in the, this is fun category, what is bothersome is when we equate that stuff like you were talking about at the beginning of the podcast all of these feelings when we associate these feelings with the anointing of the holy spirit we're that's yes. not that's not cool yes. um doing doing bible things doing what jesus says um being a servant and loving others sometimes that doesn't necessarily feel all that exciting and yet we can be confident that it is powerful, motivated by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus will get the glory. So it doesn't have to be, yeah, yes. you can get sidetracked sometimes with fun. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> yes, and I like that he talks about it's visible. Genuine Christian ministry is visible, 
It may not be that. That stuff is neither good nor bad. It's just if you like it, that's great, but don't ever say that this is what brings the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit shows up if the fruit of the Spirit is present. Is there kindness? Is there gentleness? Is there self-control? I mean, sincere love. And then also he talks about preaching the truth. We serve God, period. It's God that we serve, and that's what you're going to see and taste in our life. Okay, we have one more. I'm not going to read from this portion. It's a longer one. It's 2 Corinthians 11, 21 through 33. That's a great one to, to read through. You can see more. You're getting the idea. This is what Paul is doing in this, this letter of 2 Corinthians. But what's interesting in this portion of Scripture, he talks about this amazing thing. One sign of genuine Christian ministry is courage. He's talking about being courageous. That you are, you, it's not just confidence, but you're courageous. You try things. You will do what is needed to go love that individual. You will, you will have courage, and it comes from the Holy Spirit. It's a sign of genuine ministry. And I, I had a giggle. It's like, ooh, this sounds like a great children's story, or, or maybe one of those graphic novels that we could write, you know, with Paul as the hero, and he's talking about having this courage, that I, I have courage to minister to these people who may not think I'm all that great. And then he goes in there, too, again, saying sacrifice. Sacrifice is a hallmark of Christian ministry because Jesus set the example. Preach it, Paul, preach it. Jesus set this example. And so sacrifice is just, oh, okay, I can see their sacrifice. Like you were talking about earlier, Sam, about the events we hold here, having individuals just excited to serve because I want to see people enjoy this experience, but I also want to see people for the first time, for some of them, realize this is what Christian community looks like. And it's just amazing to watch people shift their job schedule, maybe take time off from work. People go come from work and they're really tired. But hey, mm -hmm. I love when God says, well, then just do it tired. <laughs> you can do it. Just do it tired. That's for you, Christy. <laughs> just do it tired. Um, he defines that danger can be different here in this portion of scripture he talks about facing dangers which like you were talking about earlier Otto our dangers are, are not quite the same as what Paul is experiencing his was life and death dangers but facing danger is something you will do as a Christian with genuine ministry you're not going to back down from it you are going to walk through it with Jesus and so these are just a different list I really enjoyed looking at this getting this Pauline definition of what is genuine Christian ministry because we need that because now we're going to have a little different conversation now for those who are listening tonight if you're on with us and you have a an idea you want to share an action you think that speaks of God's love of a servant heart something that someone has done for you that just showed they had a servant heart of Jesus or something you have done for someone and you just knew God wanted you to do that and it just showed a servant's heart please go ahead Go on our Facebook page and type that in, and we'll have a little conversation with you. But one of the things I also wanted to talk a little bit about, because these are things that happen, all right? And growing up, as I did as a Christian, and being in a church but not really being connected through the church, because I was pretty young, I was a, in junior high, and learning about church connection and all that, but I had an opportunity to experience different different groups that said they were ministering in Jesus' name, and then listening to different adults, because I was just, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, listening to different adults talk about what they felt Christian ministry was, and I didn't know much, right? So I'm just, oh, it's all true, right? Everything they say is true. Everything they do is true. Thankfully, I had some really strong mentors in my life, so things made sense. I was like, you know, that was kind of crazy. Well, I think that person's kind of crazy. That was not what we were intending. So that, that stuff helped, but, you know, when you're first going through it, it's like, well, I guess that's okay. No one's doing, you know what I mean? So I wanted to have a few, just some conversations about what genuine Christian ministry is not. What it is not. Uh, one of the things I can throw right out of the, the, out of the shoot here is it's not ritual. It's not a ritual. If you do A plus B equals C, then you get the presence of Christ or, or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to show up if you do this. It's like, um, no, it is a relationship. Holy Spirit's always there. So, if, if, if someone is telling you and saying you have to do this and this and this, and if you don't do this, then God's not going to show up, it's like, no, 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 no. You get in the New Testament, you go ahead and read it, and you're going to find out Jesus was all about relationship. 
He's, he's not into wealth, and you take your pen, and you stick it in your ear, and you hop on your left foot, and then that's when the Holy Spirit's going to show up. It's not like that. Why do you suppose we've been designed as relationship-oriented people? Why do you suppose community and society is something we need to be emotionally healthy? It's because we've been designed in the image of God. Relationship and community is a thing from Him. So if you get stuck up in this ritual and your head is stuck, well, I can't because I haven't done this. No, 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 no. You can because Jesus is right there. So a ritual it is not. Um, we definitely know that genuine Christian ministry has expectations of us. You can't just, oh, I'm a Christian and I can do and think and say whatever I want. It doesn't work that way. There's self-control, which is a huge part of growing as a Christian. There's expectations of relationship skills. If you love Jesus, you are definitely going to have actions in your life that show that you're in love with him, like reading the Bible, trying your best to understand it, and then after you understand it, <laughs> trying your best to live it. Um, so there's expectations when it comes to genuine Christian ministry. It's not just a great big glitter party. You are not part of the troll community, <laughs> those amazing troll movies that are so much fun. It's not like that, even though those parties look like a lot of fun and there's a lot of glitter in a troll party. Okay? Um, Christian, genuine Christian ministry is not owning a spiritual gift like I referred to earlier in this podcast. It's not like, oh, I have the gift of of healing, we're going to do this. I have the gift of faith, we're going to have this. It's like, no, 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 you don't. You don't. The gift is the Holy Spirit that comes with him, and you're just a conduit showing people to that direction. He brings those. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Now, there's two other ones that are out there, and we're just going to mention them because we're getting close to not quite an hour, so we have a few minutes. But there is this thing that it's not as... It's not as barking loud as it used to be back in the 80s and 90s, but it's definitely still around, especially attached to Pentecostal circles, which I am just very, very disheartened and sad to say. There is this thing called the prosperity gospel, where if you are living right according to God, you're going to have financial security and blessings that are of monetary end. I know, Steve, that you and I grew up in some of this. It kind of came with when we got saved growing up. And... This idea that if you're not experiencing financial blessing, then you must have sin in your life. Or if you're sick, well, of course, if you're sick, you have sin in your life, go repent. It's like, that's not scripturally accurate. Oh, so not scripturally accurate. And it's not genuine Christian ministry. Steve, did you ever bounce into the prosperity gospel? Oh, yes. I, uh, I didn't go through it. I had a watch it happen and it was the name it and claim it movement there it's uh mm -hmm. you know, mama wants an el dorado so just say it and believe it and you're gonna get it in jesus name <laughs> in yes. jesus, yeah, and i was like oh what it, it just yeah it just didn't compute I don't yes know. the more you read scripture the harder it was to accept that mm -hmm. kind of stuff because it didn't match it's like i respect you as a leader and what you're saying but i just not finding a way that it meshes in scripture Pastor Robin or Sam, did either one of you ever have an ex uh, experience with this? I, I can did remember not. Um, being uh, fascinated because I kept hearing what you need is more faith. Yes. Really, really at the bottom line of all of this, if you want to see the Holy Spirit moving in your life, if you want your uh, these gifts to grow in your life, what you need is more faith. Okay. And so it set me on this journey searching scripture. Okay, where am I going to find... Um, yep. you know, first correlations that tells me verse 47, this is what you do to get more faith. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I was just frustrated because it, you know, it all boils down to, you know, the faith that the Lord puts in our heart, the size of a mustard seed, and that can move a mountain. So it was just confusing. It really didn't help me. Yeah. I just. Yep. It's, it was interesting and it mm -hmm. brought a lot of shame. Shame yeah. was definitely attached to that teaching. Yeah, I did not experience it personally, but I think you hit the nail on the head with, does it align with what the scripture says? Yes. Does the scripture say, if you hop on your left <laughs> foot five times, that this will happen? Right. Absolutely not. Well, right, so. it tells us our actions can force the Holy Spirit to do what we want him to do. That's basically what it's saying. And it's right. like, yeah. Right. And it's interesting because there's 13 New Testament warnings against riches, and there's absolutely zero against being poor. <laughs> it 
it's like being poor is not a sign that you are less or something's wrong. Usually there's economic reasons, there's societal reasons, there's yeah. uh, hi- history where if you if your mother and your grandmother grew up in poverty, it's amazing. The per- it's eighty over 80% chance you're going to stay and grow up in poverty and live in it the rest of your life. So there is a generational thing to just mm-hmm. getting out of it is hard, this idea. So there's just all of this other stuff that we could actually, if you believe in that type of prosperity, you want to see people prosper, you can actually get your little body busy and help people in that cycle find ways for it. But that yeah. is another conversation. Another thing, too, is the word that is translated in the New Testament, no, in the Old Testament, Dr. Hayford says, um, as prosperity, actually, more often that same word is translated as peace. It is the same word. It can be used for both. And the, that, that reference are in the notes. So if you're listening and you're kind of curious where that came from, go on realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday nights, and it's actually listed in the notes in reference to Dr. Hayford. And he talks about what is real prosperity, going through all of that. And there also is listed in the notes in the Women's Study Bible from... Um, Thomas Nelson, it talks about prosperity is always linked to a purpose. God always links his prosperity to a purpose. It's not because you're so cute, although, Sam, I got to say, you're a cute kid. I'm sure you were, <laughs> you've got really cute kids, so you probably were a cute kid. But God links it to a purpose. You're not getting blessed by God to play and swim in your own tub of glitter. It's usually given to us so we can love others with it. Um, blessing is always connected to issues of character. If God can trust you, with this big bucket of glitter, he's going to give you this big bucket of glitter because he knows you're going to do something right with it. And prosperity definitely, definitely has something to do with God's agenda for for the world more than our personal desires. Just saying. You can desire what you want, but God has a reason, and this is what he's looking for, and this is what he'd like to see happen. Now, there's another thing, and I'm not going to get a whole lot into it because I do not have the inside skinny. But this is called the New Apostolic Reformation, New Age Cult. And the information's in the notes on our website. There's also things you can look up online that define it. But it's just interesting because it seems to focus on sign wonders, miracles, all these different things. And what's funny is I believe a lot of the, the different things they approach, there's things I believe in miracles, I believe in signs and wonders. I believe that... Um, we have interactions in the supernatural. It is just the focus of so much of this becomes on the people and on the leadership instead of on Christ. And so the notes are there. I wasn't sure if anybody, I know all of you have seen the notes I put together. I didn't know if anyone had anything they wanted to say about it. What's interesting is Pastor Robin and I have a small connection with that in that we've had a ministry that we've organized and put together here at Maranatha. And one of the aspects of that, and we had some of the things here, was we had a Sozo prayer ministry um, session happened. They were showing us how it was done, and it was an amazing experience. It was extremely effective. First time I've ever seen it. It's interesting because that Sozo ministry is listed in this article. It gave them the creepy feet, and they they listed why they had a hard time with it, and they think it's not healthy. And it's interesting because as we went through it, and then we started looking and researching, and we found there was some information. It was great. It was great getting the info. And we read and learned from it. Some of it we agreed with. Some of it just didn't fit with us because we couldn't find a, a scriptural foundation for mm-hmm. some of the things that they were talking about. So we didn't want to use those. But there was good in it. And we actually used uh, Pastor Robin's research and wrote our prayer works department. Their actual, um, the actual um, bu- 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 booklet, our, our guidelines for in training for prayer works here at Maranatha, came from Pastor Robin's research with that. And so it's interesting to read through that article that I know some of what they're talking about, and I've seen some of it as good. So when you go through that article, please read it with an open mind, but realize whatever you could take, and people have done it through history, and it won't stop until Jesus comes back. They will take God's word. I mean, you just look at slavery. Hello? How could Mm -hmm. anyone take and read God's word and think you could own another human being? But they did. They still do. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that is just absolutely upside down. And so we're going back to where we, be- where we began. We're going to end tonight looking at Matthew 28. Matthew 28 is Jesus' guidelines for what is genuine Christian ministry. He is telling us. And we, if you go to membership class here at Maranatha, you're going to have this thing read to you left and right and upside down. Jesus came and he told his disciples, 
This is his last words. He's telling him, hey guys, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Mm -hmm. I want you, that is what genuine Christian ministry does. It doesn't make Pastor Orlean disciples. It doesn't make Sam disciples. It doesn't make Otto disciples, although Otto, you're a great guy. It doesn't make Pastor Robin disciples. It doesn't make Bruce disciples. It makes disciples of Jesus. Go make disciples of all nations. Baptizing him in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit, because that is who we worship, the triune God. Teach these new disciples. Teach them. Teach them to what? Have a great concert. No. Teach them to what? Go paint the parking lot pink. No. <laughs> Teach them to do what? To obey what Scripture says. To obey all my commands that I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we see Jesus' heart here as he's saying his last words, his last verbal embrace before he ascends. You are supposed to be about raising disciples of me, raising disciples that, that are disciples of Jesus. You're to be baptizing them as a public outside sign of an inward work. And you're supposed to teach them these things. You're supposed to teach them the commands that are in the Bible. Genuine mm -hmm. Christian ministry falls in that, that trifecta, that triangle of, of, what would you say, foundational triangle that Jesus is speaking here. Mm -hmm. And this is what he wants us to remember. This is what Paul was focusing on as he went through and trying to defend himself amongst these different miracle workers that were showing up, these different so-called self-entitled apostles that came and said, Paul's ministry is just not flashy enough. He, he's, just not, he's just not bringing it. He doesn't do this. He doesn't have that. Look at he He's too concerned with people who are hungry. He's too, I mean, whatever they were saying, whatever fault they could find. And Paul is bringing them back to what Jesus said. It's about raising disciples that love Christ and teaching them to live the way that he did. So I'd like to leave with this thought. What is your definition of God's heart? What does it look like? You need to have an answer to that because that is your guide for how you love others. That is your guide for genuine Christian ministry because it's all about his heart. It's all about Jesus. With that, Otto, I turn to you. Thank you for joining us for this week's discussion on Considering Second Corinthians, Genuine Christian Ministry. To enjoy this process live, come join us and the Wednesday night crew every Wednesday evening at 6.30 streamed live for the for seeable future. Make sure you tell your friends, your relatives, and everybody to tune into this, especially with being shut in like this. This gives you an opportunity to actually be a part of something. This is Steve Lundy reminding you to always be kind.